Hello, I'm Jonas Rewinski. Welcome on board the Eastern Express. As always, I hope you enjoy the journey. In this episode, we're diving into the Russian disinformation, a pool so murky and filled with lies that even the lifeguard is part of the conspiracy. And who's splashing around in the deep end, you ask? Well, it's the Kremlin, backstroking through falsehoods like an Olympic swimmer on steroids, which, coincidentally, they might also deny. Let's explore how Putin regime lies, why does it do so, and how come they always seem to get away with it? First, let's take a look at our report to find out more, and then we'll be delving deeper into the subject. The attack on March 22nd has been described as the worst attack on Russian soil in the last two decades. What is more tragic, however, is that if Moscow had listened to warnings predating the incident, the loss of life could have been avoided. According to the White House, Washington sent Russia a notice saying that a terrorist attack in Russia was likely. However, heeding the warning would have been a sign of weakness, given its source. According to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace think tank, this clearly shows that the Kremlin values loyalty over competence from its security forces. This Washington-based think tank says that over the last few decades, Moscow and the FSB have been engaging in perfidy, or in other words, a persistent disregard for truth or facts. This attitude is also apparent in the way the Kremlin reacted to the incident. Almost immediately, Russian officials, including Vladimir Putin, tried putting the blame for the terrorist attack on Ukraine. This continued even as the Islamic State affiliate ISIS-K claimed full responsibility for the attack. This wasn't the first time Moscow has acted this way, as the Kremlin's habit of lying to itself and its people to preserve its self-image was on full display back in the Soviet era. Analysts say this exact behavior suggests that the Russian government is barely functioning, as over the years it has placed more importance on hiring people that are compliant with the rule of law rather than competent. This unfortunately is likely to lead to events like the Crocus Concert Hall attack happening more often. And now, as always, it's time to explore the issue in greater detail. Let's begin with the Kremlin's favorite party trick. Russia is the innocent victim. Yes, according to them, Russia is just minding its own business, occasionally annexing a peninsula or two, when suddenly the world, led by those meanies in the West, starts picking on them for no reason at all. It's like claiming you're being bullied when people get upset that you've stolen their lunch, car and possibly their house. Even a nuclear power station occasionally. And if you dare to point out these slight indiscretions, you're labeled a Russophobe. Because nothing says, I'm innocent, like inventing a phobia of yourself. Moving on to the sequel, nobody asked for historical revisionism now. Clearly, this is a very long story indeed. Here, the Russia takes actual historical events and adds twists, turns, and a sprinkle of creative liberty. Did Stalin buddy up with Hitler? No. According to the Kremlin, it was more of a strategic alignment, like Batman teaming up with the Joker to host a charity event. And let's not forget the rebranding of anyone who disagrees with their vision of history as Nazis or Nazi sympathizers, because nothing smooths over an awkward dinner conversation like accusing your opponent of being a historical villain. Then, there's the classic hit, the collapse of Western civilization. According to Russia, the West is crumbling because we care about minor things like human rights, equality, and not systematically oppressing people. And who could forget the catchy tune, popular movements are US-sponsored color revolutions. Moscow certainly does, it plays it over and over and over again. Here, Russia insists that any whiff of democracy or free speech in its neighborhood must be the result of American meddling, because the concept of people voluntarily choosing not to live under autocratic regimes is just too far-fetched to believe. Lastly, we have the greatest hit, Reality is whatever the Kremlin wants it to be. In this world, Russia didn't try to poison Sergei Skripal. Alexei Navalny died of natural causes. The MH17 wasn't shot down by Russian-backed rebels. And Putin definitely, definitely does not have a secret palace. 
It's a reality where contradictions are not just accepted, they're encouraged. Because why settle for one lie when you can tell a hundred? So, there you have it. Russia's disinformation campaign is not just about lying, it's about constructing a parallel universe where up is down, left is right, and reality is whatever the Kremlin says it is. It's a strategy designed not just to mislead, but to exhaust, confuse, and ultimately make us question the very nature of truth itself. And now, here to shed more light on the issue is our guest today, Sasha Ostana from the Jacques Delors Centre at the Herty School. Hello and welcome to Eastern Express. Hello and thank you for having me. So what would be your general assessment? Who is winning the information war right now in 2024? We need to look into whose perspective we're looking at when we're judging uh, who's winning the informational war. Um, there is, of course, a, an extended um, and an expanded effort of the West, of the European Union and the US in particular, in trying to catch up with what Russia has been doing for multiple years. And I would say that this catching up is evolving and growing and getting more um, momentum and understanding in the West. Um, however, uh, Russia has started a, um, an information war many decades ago. I would even argue that Russia has never ceased um, to um, this information war after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, of course, all of those measures and all of those tabs and um, tricks that Russia has been using, they've been tested for a longer period of time. And the reason understanding from the Western part that um, they had to start increasing their efforts in the informational war way before the current events um, had started to develop. So you're saying we have to catch up, but how much damage do you think has already been done? I mean, recently we've had a member of Congress going live on CNN, I think, admitting that, yes, the Republican Party, or at least its narratives, have been infiltrated by Russian talking points. And I mean, it's not difficult to see why he's saying that. Uh, just a few days ago, I think, um, very recently, Marjorie Taylor Greene was going on TV literally repeating one of these talking points, claiming that President Zelensky is destroying religious freedom in Ukraine, which of course is not true, but many Americans don't know that. If we have members of Congress saying things like that, how much worse could it actually get? It's not even American who sometimes do not understand the difference between the Russian talking points, Russian narratives and the actual situation on the field. It's also the problem is persistent in Europe because we do see um, some Russian talking points being repeated um, by influential figures, by politicians, by opinion makers, without realizing how um, aligned they are with the Kremlin. Of course, there's an argument that there are people who work with Russian security services, people who are infiltrated by Russian security services, and voluntarily or involuntarily bringing those narratives because they've been in contact with Russian security services for many years. At the same time, there is also a number of people who just picked up on those narratives without realizing that they uh, originated from the Kremlin and have nothing to do with the reality. Um, how much worse can it get? I think we will see the results of it um, during the election this year, first in the European U Union in June and then in the US in November, and we can judge if the Russian information war has gained more influence over the audience in the US and the European Union. But there is a definitely a need to catch up and a need to disentangle what Russia has been saying for all of those years. Um, and there is a definitely a need to educate people how we should differentiate between the truth, um, the opinion, and the lies that Russia's um, propaganda machine has been supplying for all of those years. Um, to the rest of the world. Which is to say, well, how much worse could it get? We could have a US president repeating Russian talking points. Now, the times we live in, right? But you actually make an excellent point here. Recently, the Washington Post has published an article in which it goes into excruciating detail on how this whole system 
actually works. And now, um, you've mentioned that many people might not be aware of the fact that they are in fact um, reading and then regurgitating Russian propaganda. This seems to have been exactly the point. I mean, the whole system was based upon um, uh, news outlets uh, which could then, you know, appearing somewhere across the world, like in the Middle East or in Africa, uh, producing a piece of fake news. Then it is being picked up upon by ostensibly legitimate sources in the West, English language sources, but they can be tra tra traced to Russia. Thing is, when this is released out into the open, the original sources can often go blank, they just vanish, and so it's untraceable. Do you think that we actually have any sort of methods to counter this sort of information laundering operation? Because this is what it is really, malign influence being spread with hardly any methods to track it down to its original source. We do have methods to um, stop this misinformation and disinformation being spread. One of those methods is just to ban Russian language propaganda um, TV channels or newspapers that are still operating in Europe. I mean, I live in Germany, in Berlin, and the RT, the Russia Today office, is still operating despite being sanctioned by the European Union. The same goes with a, a few Russian language newspapers in um, Germany that are openly being sold um, without any restrictions. And I do believe that if we go deep and check the content, that's going to be one of the sources where people get misinformation and disinformation originated from Russia. So there are methods how to curb this Russian influence. And there were attempts to use those methods. And Unfortunately, they were just not successful because you not only need to introduce those methods, you also need to implement them. And this implementation part is still missing. Um, my question would be why. Um, one hypothesis would be that there's simply not enough people who would go after and then keep an eye on whether A, this new media outlet is still functioning, or B, whether it has been um, closed and then reopened in a different form. Um, and so, yeah, there is this implementation part that um, still needs to be improved. And I know that when talking about um, media organizations that are functioning from within Russia or from other countries that are still um, have some influence in the EU and in, in the US, because thanks to the Internet, everyone can access them. Well, it's this eternal freedom of speech dilemma, right? I mean, this is what has made us so powerful as democracies. We have freedom of speech. We are not telling anyone what to think. But on the other hand, dictatorships, they don't have restrictions like that. So they will ban everything they don't like. They will use legislation like the um, foreign agents uh, law that Russia has uh, introduced. So effectively, they control their own information space, not letting anyone in. Uh, but we, understandably, we have qualms about this. What if we go too far? What if we just start to uh, shut down news outlets and later on somebody will say, wait a minute, this was not disinformation. This is simply something the government of this country or that country does not agree with. So uh, how do you think it is possible to maintain a balance here? I mean, full and complete lack of controls doesn't seem to be an option anymore. So we need to do something. But how far should we go? We should definitely at least take one step and look into how we can A, ban and B, implement those bans on Russian media outlets that spread uh, just outrageous disinformation. And Germany could be one example. I mean, you cannot, um, there are legal um, restrictions against um, some World War II or post-World War II narratives that cannot be argued. Um, you, for instance, cannot say that Nazi Germany has committed her her horrendous crimes against um, the, its Jewish population and Jewish population in other countries. Um, so Germany, I'm pretty sure, can um, share its experience, how it's working, what are the advantages and disadvantages, and then these can be implemented um, and used against Russian propaganda narratives. Um, on the other hand, there is also um, a licensing issue in which a country can look um, into media outlets that are applying for this license and then judge if those media outlets um, trying to spread disinformation. How, for instance, uh, RT or Russia Today had done at the very beginning. Russia Today was never a independent news media or independent source of um, news outside of Russia or within Russia. It always said that its primary objective is to spread Russian narratives among the English-speaking societies. Um, so I think that the, 
giving a license to a media organization that's coming from a dictatorship and then saying that it's going to spread the Russian mm. narratives in a democracy, that could be already questioned. So I think there are two main tracks. First, looking into the licensing procedures, and second, looked into um, a larger picture of what kind of narratives or what kind of information a specific media outlet is spreading. Russia Today is a fairly easy, easy case, so to say, because they do what, the, what it says on the tin, right? I mean, it's Russia Today. What about the outlets which are very sneaky? They pretend to be based here in the West. Uh, they, pre they pretend like they have a primarily Western-based agenda. They often uh, pretend like they are uh, most, like, you know, right-wing, conservative, they are against migration, and ever so often they just sneak in something about Ukraine being corrupt. So basically, Russian propaganda in disguise. Now, these are very difficult, especially if they are based on the internet, because hard to shut them down, right? Would you, could you imagine a situation whereby we take uh, very decisive steps, like trying to shut down these sites? Uh, I mean, it sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, like some sort of cyber police, effectively. But do we still have a choice? Isn't this the future that we're being pushed into by our rivals, by authoritarian states? I think it's unlikely that there is going to be a political momentum of shutting down those media outlets. And you rightly mentioned the freedom of speech that should be still upheld in democracies. Um, what we can do against those media organizations is to provide a platform that can not specifically counter those narratives, but provide people with um, unbiased information that could be used as a trusted source. Um, there is often this um, misunderstanding of how we should address those media outlets spreading propaganda or spreading misinformation, is that we need to go into them and look into them and spend time on to studying and developing narratives against it. And of course, that is costly and that reduces the resources that any specific organization has available. So instead of that, I think working on providing unbi unbiased trustworthy information would be a solution. And then on the political side, there should be definitely an educational campaign for people on how you can identify what is misinformation, what is disinformation, and how which media outlets you basically can trust and which media outlets do not have, should not have this privilege. So it is overall a very long and winding path until this issue can be addressed. And then there are curveballs like uh, Elon Musk's ex, formerly Twitter, and the way it looks like today. Unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss that particular example. And that clearly is one of the most difficult aspects of the whole case. Still, Sasha Ostanina was our guest today here on TVP World. Thank you very much for joining us and for sharing your insight. Thank you for inviting me. And now, moving on to Eastern News Flash, a curated selection of all the other stories from the East that you really don't want to miss. Russia has recently ramped up its attacks on Ukraine's civilian infrastructure, targeting the country's power system and bringing misery to millions. The lights were turned out across vast areas of the country, and Ukraine had to lean on its neighbors, including Poland, for emergency supplies. Now a new strategy has been revealed to protect against Russian strikes. Power workers in the Kharkiv region battled to restore supplies to desperate locals. It's a never-ending job that's got more challenging since the invaders stepped up their attacks on the electricity network. To mitigate against Moscow's attempts to turn out the lights, Ukraine's state power operator, Ukrenego, is now looking to decentralize electricity production. The energy giant plans to build hundreds of small power plants across the country. Ukrenego's CEO, Vladimir Kudaritsky, says this will make it more difficult for the Kremlin to cripple a power network. Japan recently provided Kyiv with 70 small-scale generators to stabilize power supplies. In addition to solar and wind plants already in the pipeline, Ukrenego will explore new thermal generation technology that runs on waste from the lumber and agricultural sectors. Experts will also look to develop what it calls gas peakers, small, highly maneuverable power plants that run on gas and electricity storage systems. 
A recent poll sheds light on American perceptions on the likelihood of another world war and whether they would be willing to serve should such a war happen. While the majority of Americans believe in another global conflict, only a fraction, just 9%, said they would be willing to serve if called upon. Just months after Ukraine's President Zelensky traveled to Washington, the survey reveals that a significant portion of Americans, 61 percent, believe another world war is on the horizon. 22 percent consider it very likely to occur within the next five to ten years. YouGov spoke to 1,000 U.S. adult citizens earlier this year. 72 percent believe if another world war were to break out, Russia would be involved and would be on a different side than the U.S. Despite the anticipation of war, the willingness of Americans to actively participate is limited. Only 6 percent would volunteer for military service in the event of a world war, with an additional 9 percent willing to serve if called up. However, if the U.S. faced an imminent threat of invasion, the willingness to volunteer for military service increases to 16 per cent. And now a musical clampdown in Russia's Republic of Chechnya. Authorities there have imposed limits on music tempos to abide by strict cultural norms in the deeply conservative Muslim-majority region. Means no heavy metal, probably. Russia's President Vladimir Putin meets with the head of the Republic of Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov, equally hardline and restrictive. Kadyrov has instructed his culture minister, Musa Dadaev, to make Chechen music conform to, in his words, the Chechen mentality. The culture ministry has now passed the message to musicians and singers. A ministry statement said from now on, all musical, vocal and choreographic works must correspond to a tempo of 80 to 116 beats per minute. The new tempo standard is relatively slow in the context of popular music. ABBA's Eurovision winner Waterloo has a tempo of 148 beats per minute. The culture minister says borrowing musical culture from other peoples is not permitted. Local artists have been ordered to rewrite their music by June 1st to accommodate the changes. Otherwise, they will not be allowed for public performance. And for this episode of Eastern Express, it's the end of the line. Please stay with us here on TVP World for more latest news and features. I'm Jana Szerwinski. Bye for now.